Welcome everyone to the AU Care Work and the Economy Project and the Levy Economic Institute of Bard College Intensive Course. Um, I'm Maria Floro, I'm Professor of Economics at American University, and I'm also the PI for the Care Work and the Economy Project. In the first few minutes, I will first introduce the Care Work and the Economy Project, as well as go over with you the intensive course uh, schedule and a few uh, reminders. After that, I will start with the first lecture that gives you an overview on gender and the economy. First, I'd like to introduce to you the Care Work and the Economy Project. This started in 2017. It's a group of 40 or more researchers from around the world uh, that strive to reduce gender gaps in economic outcomes and enhance gender equality by eliminating and properly valuing the broader economic and social contributions of caregivers. This research is motivated after observing how efforts to promote inclusive growth and sustainable development are often undermined by the lack of gender awareness in existing policy tools. The invisibility of the care economy in key policy tools such as macroeconomic models has led to the neglect of adequately addressing the care needs in an integrated manner. We have partnerships with two institutions one is the Center for Transnational Migration and Social Inclusion of Seoul National University, as well as the Levy Economic Institute, who is co-sponsoring and co-organizing this course. You can learn more about the care work and the economy research by going into the www.careworkeconomy.org research.american.edu. Now I would like to go over with you the agenda for the next three weeks. I'm very happy that you have uh, particip you are participating in this intensive course and that you are one of the selected uh, fellows. It will be an intensive three weeks, but I hope that you will gain much from understanding more about gender awareness and macroeconomic models for use in policy analysis. Today and we will have an overview of gender and economics, followed by another second session, gender relations in household. The next four days is going to be on the microeconomic foundations of macro gender aware macroeconomic analysis. So in the second day, one of our instructors will talk about gender relations in labor market followed by a second session on demographic and economic change and demand for care. In day three, we, you will examine more in depth the meaning of care and the nature of care work. You will also learn how to measure, estimate, and account for unpaid work using time use survey data. In day four, you will learn more about the estimation of the unpaid care sector with an illustration on the case of South Korea, followed by a group exercise. You'll learn more about the paid caregivers and the market for care in day five, and this will be followed by a second session on social labor and care policies. In day six, you will learn about measuring the paid care sector using variety of secondary data such as labor force surveys, household survey, and other special survey. It will be followed by a second session that provide an illustration on how to measure it, again, using South Korea as an example. Day seven will start the discussion on gender, care, and macroeconomics. It starts with an introduction, followed by a group exercise in session two. For day eight, you'll learn more about gender, growth, and distribution, and this will be followed by another group exercise. In day nine, you'll learn about the social 
accounting matrix database and an, an overview of this very important tool for policy uh, analysis. This will be followed uh, in uh, like the second session of day nine with the introduction on the Levy Economic Institute macro micro model. More of this Levy macro micro model will be covered in day 10, followed by a group exercise. In the third week of this intensive course, we'll start with continuation of the discussion of the Levy macro micro model with some applications and a group exercise. In day 12, this will wrap up uh, in the, uh, the Levy macro micro model will be wrapped up in the first session. And this will be followed by a primer on the gender aware care social accounting matrix, which has been developed by our researchers in the Care Work and the Economy Project. Basically, it's an extended social accounting matrix for care and gender aware analysis. Days 13 and 14 will then apply or use this social accounting matrix database in the computable general equilibrium model to, to be used for policy simulation. This will focus on the analysis of care and followed by exercise and group discussion. More of what we call the GEM care, computable general equilibrium model will be covered in day 14 and day 15. At the end of the three weeks or in the, at the end of day 15, we will have a closing session right after session two. So stay with us after session two on day 15 for a closing ceremony. Now I just want to provide a few reminders. Please make sure that you read ahead the required readings because that's very important in ensuring that you get the most out of the lectures and interaction with your instructors and facilitators, as well as your other fellows in the course. You can, have, you can continue the discussion after class or after the sessions among the fellows between classes uh, in the Slack workspace. You can also reach to your, your instructors and facilitators through the Slack workspace, but uh, facilitators and instructors will have their office hours that you can visit uh, and talk to them. Uh, for example, in my case, I will have office hours on June 28, 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and June 29, 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'll be sending you a Zoom link to join me during my office hours. I want to emphasize also this regular attendance and participation in group exercises and is important. Um, so you will be getting at the end of the course, um, a course certificate and uh, that will be given to you um, at least virtually at the closing ceremony. Are there any questions? Okay, um, feel free to ask any questions. Uh, you can use your uh, raised hand if you like, or you can use chat if you have any questions regarding the course, as well as some of the reminders I have uh, mentioned uh, earlier. I see um, somebody, is, is it, uh, is someone raising their hand? I'm, I'm not able to see you. I don't think so. Okay. Um, questions, but. Okay. It um, yeah, well, uh, let me just add a couple of things about the, um, um, some logistics. First of all, um, 
there is a bio of fellows in this time zone. The Amer we call this the America's time zone that's available in the Care, Work and Economy um, website. Um, so please do check the bios of the fellows as well as the instructors and facilitators of this course at, at the uh, Care, Work and the Economy uh, project website. The other thing I'd like to mention is that my office hours in this slide is um, uh, needs to be corrected for June 29. I did send a note to everyone that um, we will be having the I'll be having rather my office hours tomorrow, Tuesday at 9 to 10 a.m. Um, and this will be through Zoom, um, and you have um, have access to the Zoom link for my office hours. Um, uh, the, um, uh, um, and you can feel free to stop by and, and chat with me more on some of the concepts and questions or issues that come up in, in today's lecture. Um, one final uh, additional reminder, um, regular attendance is very important uh, as well as participation in the group exercises um, in order for you to get the most out of this course. Should there be some unexpected circumstances, including internet issue uh, that may arise and you are unable to attend the, a lecture or a session and the discussion that follows that lecture, um, you can do a makeup uh, by um, watching the pre-recorded video session by yourself when once your internet for example works and um, write a 400 word reaction essay um, to respond to the points raised in that session, as well as to the discussion questions that are posted in the um, uh, mentioned in the video recording and submit that um, uh, essay at the end of the week, of that week. So by Sunday at 5 p.m. We will uh, provide this information to you um, uh, via Slack, as well as uh, uh, post it in our website. Any other questions? Okay, if not, we will continue. Lucy, please go ahead. Now I would like to start the course overview and introduction to gender constructs and also introduce to you an exciting field in the economics discipline called feminist economics. My lecture for today covers three parts. One is the concept of gender. The second would be the economics as a socially constructed discipline. And third, I'll talk about the dev development and nature of feminist economics. Gender, as you know, is a different concept from that of sex. Gender defines and differentiates the roles, rights, responsibilities, and obligations of women and men as shaped by prevailing social norms. That's very different from the biological differences between men, females, and males, because it, these differences are interpreted by society to create a set of social expectations. These social expectations or social ascribed roles define the behavior that is deemed appropriate for women and for men. They also determine women's and men's differential access to rights, resources, and power in society. So just to compare your sex on your left-hand side, where you have biological difference between men and women, but gender assigns a particular hierarchy 
to men and to women in society, in the economy, in the workplace. And oftentimes, okay, this gender relations is not Something's wrong, you see? Are unequal and manifested in various ways. You'll learn more about these gender manifestations of unequal relations between men and women in the coming sessions or in the, ne in the de next days ahead. The sign reading for today's lecture is chapter two of the book by Benaria et al called Gender Development and Globalization, Economics as If All People Matter. What that chapter states is that gender is a concept that evolved as the, over time. It has a historical evolution. It's a specific conditions that lead to how society interprets the differences between men and women, say in, in labor force participation, in marriage arrangements, in inheritance rules, and so forth. Gender also embodies power relations. As I mentioned earlier, there's a hierarchy that is given to men's position in society vis-a-vis -vis that of women. And there's an imbalance in power that assigns authority, agency, and decision-making power in men, whether it be in politics, in economics, and, and in uh, other uh, institutions, other aspects of social life. In economics, gender relations permeate economic institutions such as household, labor markets, credit markets, and as well as the formation formulation and evaluation of policies. This way policies are shaped or are designed can modify or exacerbate these existing gender inequalities. Now I'd like to break you into groups and I will give into groups of five and I'll give you six minutes to discuss among yourselves this question. How is the issue of gender treated in economics, then explain how this treatment of gender can have a bearing on policy making. I will give you a one minute warning before you uh, uh, close the breakout groups. And afterwards, some, um, some of you, um, one of the members can share to the rest of the class some of the insights and uh, discussion that you have in answering this question. I'll now continue with the second part of this lecture. We talk about economics as a socially constructed, constructed discipline. So economics is a creation as a field or as a discipline it's a creation of groups of individuals, predominantly men, reflecting the way they have come to think about economic life. Its development is influenced by the interests and biases of economic theorists and dominant thinkers, ranging from Adam Smith to David Ricardo to John Stuart Mill, John Maynard Keynes, Karl Marx, and so forth. Underlying these theories and models is actually an assumption of how masculinity and femininity are socially constructed. 
So these theories and models embodies that social construction of masculinity and femininity. So my first point, and it's an important one, knowledge is produced. It is constructed by thinkers and reflects their perception of social reality. So let's go back to economics as a constructed body of knowledge. Okay, you are very familiar with the Homo economicus Robinson Crusoe in your initial, um, introductory economics. Economics is based on deeply ingrained practices in ways of knowing and theorizing. We're even unconscious of these ingrained practices. They are shaped by influential thinkers way back in the 19th century, uh, such as Francis Edgeworth, who wrote mathematical physics, whereby he said, economic questions are examined with mathematical precisions and exactness. So economics gained that sort of characteristic of being quantitative, formalistic, mathematical, at least the modern economics that we know today. It is also sort of um, uh, um, supposed to have the character of being objective, that men are rational thinkers. And this is based from the influential work of Alfred Marshall on principles of economics, expressed his belief in self-adjusting, self-correcting nature of the economic world and assumes rational behavior of autonomous individualistic agents. Economics is also shown to be positive and neutral. Therefore, it's value-free. Milton Friedman in 1953 wrote the methodology of positive economics and said, a theory's validity should not be judged by the realism of its underlying assumptions but rather by the accuracy of its predictions. In effect, theories should be judged, should be viewed as if their assumptions were true. The modern economics that we know today and that you have learned in your graduate school has been dominated by neoclassical economics. Okay, so you are very familiar with what we call the rational economic man, imbued with autonomy as an individuality, has a free will, and therefore you have economics as really a study of choice, okay? And that choice is made by weighing the marginal benefit versus the marginal cost, hence the marginalist analysis or what we call rational choice theory. Let me then sort of summarize a few things about the economics discipline and profession. It's male dominated. Majority of its influential theories and economic models are based on Western industrialized countries experience. They tend to assume in general, at least in microeconomics, you know, complete markets unless stated otherwise perfect information, unless stated otherwise, strong sense of individualism, and of course, characterized by so-called rational autonomous agents. This of course shape the policies to which it provide guidance and whose, uh, in which whereby economic models serve as foundations or framework. Therefore, we should not be surprised that if economics as a constructed body of knowledge reflect a particular perception of social reality, who produce goods and services that are valued, for example, in exchange in the market, they will represent, in other words, this body of knowledge will primarily represent the interests of certain groups, often at the expense of those excluded or made invisible in economic models and theories. This persistence of what we call male bias and exclusion of say minorities or other ethnic groups and race in the 
economics discipline is reflected in the United States in terms of the female faculty in economics department and also um, you know, um, the representation of Blacks and Hispanics. This slide here is based on a study by Shelley Ludberg and Stearns, as well as by Bayer and uh, Cecilia Rouse, who is currently the president of the Council of Economic Advisors under the Biden administration. In the United States, female faculty in economics department in 2017 represent only 13% of full professors. Um, when we talk about Blacks and Hispanics, together they occupy only 6.3% of all full-time tenured and tenure track economics position. In PhD granting economics departments in the United States, Black economists represent only 1.6%. So the experience of Black women and men, as well as Hispanics and other um, immigrant communities in the United States may or may not be represented fully and adequately in economic models or even econ empirical analysis. Feminist economics want to incorporate the voice of a group, a significant half of the world's population whose contributions or part of it have been invisible and neglected in the economics discourse. That's the voice of women, and that's the ex their experience, particularly in performing unpaid work. Feminist economics raise difficult questions that are irritating to those with a mindset. Okay, why are you asking this question? That's not in the table, right? Feminist economics challenges standard or accepted concepts and assumptions, methodologies, and interpretation of stylized paths. As we will see later on, feminist economics not only criticize the existing models for being gender biased or gender blind, but they also provide alternative concepts, alternative definitions, alternative methodologies, and alternative models. In other words, they expand the boundaries of knowledge. Simply put, feminist economics transforms one way of thinking about economics or the provisioning for day-to-day -day living. It's not just adding women and stir. It's not just putting a gender dummy in your regression analysis. It's more than that. So let's talk about some features of feminist economics. First of all, feminist economics draw from many traditions. You'll find in the literature and feminist economics, you know, uh, those researchers and scholars who have extended the neoclassical model, like the tier of the household, okay, um, not just being, you know, sort of run by a benevolent dictator, i.e., the household head, but that you can have collect uh, some bargaining and some uh, negotiation taking place in the household. It also draws from heterodox economics, Keynesian, post Keynesian, institutionalist, postmodern, and so forth. And importantly, it also draws from other disciplines, anthropology, sociology, psychology, law. They provide key insights on the different experiences of women and men that tend to be ignored or have not been fully analyzed or examined within economics. As I mentioned earlier, Econ uh, feminist economics challenges underlying assumptions in economics. For example, it challenges the rational economic man assumption. As Julie Nelson and Ray, uh, Gabriel Ma pointed out in, in their article in 2003, they said, well, the rational economic man, that Robinson Crusoe, doesn't seem to have any childhood or old age doesn't have any dependence on anyone, no responsibility for anyone but himself. The environment has no effect on him, but rather is merely the passive material presented as constraints over which his rationality has played. That is the maximizing utility or maximizing profit function. He interacts with society without being influenced by society. His mode of interaction is through an ideal market in which prices form the only 
and only necessary form of communication. Prices is a market signal. It allocates all the resources. It balances your supply and demand. Prices is the main and only information that you need. So what feminist economics does is to sort of analyze what is this rational economic man? And note, noted that there is a very strong endocentric bias in economics. It also questions dualistic thinking. Are you emotional? Oh, those are the women. Or are you rational? Those are the men. This is the public domain and this is the private domain. Oh, you are very subjective, whereas I am subject objective. Oh, that's a masculine trait, and this is a feminine trait. That's problematic. This dualistic uh, thinking, that's what feminist economics is saying. It also problematizes its defined domain, that of the market. And we'll have more of that later on. Feminist economics rejects the self-interested autonomous economic agent depicted in mainstream economic models. Instead, feminist economics says what we have, it should we have in our model, in our theory, in our framework, is an economic agent who is an individual, yes, but he who is interdependent and is part of a network of social relations in household, communities, and markets. For example, decisions and and of choice of career, for example, or how you allocate your time can be influenced by social norms, by accepted social expectations. You're part of a community that has this particular kind of ascribed roles. And therefore you have to see this person who is a housewife, but also a mother of five, who can be a nurse, I could be a community volunteer who can be a consumer and a carer of aging parents. The same thing for the husband. The husband is a father, is a fisherman, a market vendor. He's part of a credit cooperative and is also a consumer. Now, another important aspect of feminist economics is that it acknowledges the underlying power relations and the intersectionality of gender with other social relations based on class, race and ethnicity. This is very important. It does not claim to be purely objective, but what it says is that family, that there is, it's crucial to recognize different, stand, different standpoints among women by illuminating their varying experiences across social classes and cultures. A woman CEO may not entirely have the same viewpoint as the cleaner or the babysitter of her, of her daughter, of her daughter. Okay, they have, even though they're both women, they have entirely different viewpoints because of their experience and of their social class. Okay, and it's also important to acknowledge that women belong to certain groups. Whether you're in a wealthy class, you're white, can exert power over other women in the basis of their class, race, and ethnicity. Ethnicity. So it's not just the relationship between men and women, but also the differentiation among women in the basis of other types of other forms of social relations. A key aspect of feminist economics is that its center, its starting point is human well being. Human well being is the goal and should be the central measure of economic success. It's not GDP. GDP is important, I mean, uh, production of goods and services and earned income is a means to a bet to the end, and that is improvement of human well-being. Okay. But standard growth tiers tend to set the primary evaluation criteria for a successful economy or a good life on the concept of money and income levels or the capacity to produce goods and services for the, for the market. Money incomes can at best be a means to a good life, but it does not define that life as Marxism points out. What it misses is much of care provisioning, a crucial element of societal well-being. It also ignores, um, money income also ignores the question of whether or not human rights are violated in being able to earn that income or profit. 
Feminist economics adopts, therefore, a broader notion of the economy. In its view, economics is a study of provisioning by society as a whole, and it involves a range of activities that engage people for the provisioning of human life. In the interest of time, I will just show you the circular flow diagram, but I would like to ask you later when you go over the readings again, uh, to look and uh, learn more about this reimagined circular flow diagram. In this reimagined circular flow diagram from a feminist economist perspective, you have the market economy as well as the non-market care economy. The market economy produce the yellow lines, the good and services and, monet uh, and monetary flows from the business sector, from the public sector and the household. The non-market care economy is represented here by the blue lines that actually is involved in the reproduction, reproduction sustenance and uh, development of the labor force. And much of that work is performed in the household. So just to reiterate the main point uh, about feminist economics and its difference from the standard economics uh, notion of what is an economy, from a feminist economist perspective, this notion of the economy involves a wide range of activities that make use of paid and unpaid labor, all aimed in the provisioning of human life. And therefore, feminist economics gives emphasis on the importance of care and unpaid labor in the development of human capabilities, the reproduction of the labor force and social reproduction. Put in another way, basically your market economy is run on the unpaid labor performed invisibly and not monetized that helps in the development of human capabilities, early childhood, the reproduction of the labor force, and so forth. I want to also mention here an interesting quote from Janet Yellen, who is now the US Treasury Secret Secretary, but when she was interviewed uh, in November, when she was still a nominee for that position, her reason for becoming an economist, she said, I care about people. I discovered that economics was of enormous relevance to our lives and had the potential to make the world a better place. So it is about people. Economics is about people. Okay. But another interesting aspect of feminist economics is that it is interested not only in economic outcomes, but also on the processes that generate these outcomes. It has questions on how do inequalities come about? What are the structural or underlying causes of inequalities? Which groups are involved in maintaining or benefiting from them? Feminist economics also argues that ethical judgments are valid and inescapable part of economic analysis. It therefore questions the standard notion of objectivity in theories, economic theories, that it is value pre. It's not saying that objective, you can be subjective and just present your own perception. But what it is saying is that a strong objectivity ought to be formulated, one that involves a process one that emerges at the level of the research community and debates among researchers who bring a variety of perspective. That is what a strong objectivity is. This is my viewpoint. I am a middle-class economics professor, female, Asian American, living in Washington DC, that shapes my own perspective. It would be very different from a Hispanic uh, uh, caregiver working in a nursing home who just arrived uh, uh, to the United States 
a few years ago. Finally, I want to mention the feminist economics adopts a pluralist approach in its methodologies. Feminist economics learns and adopts tools developed from other social and behavioral sciences, including sociology, anthropology, political science, history, and psychology. Which methods are appropriate? Well, that depends on your research question. Not all research questions, for example, can be answered using quantitative methodologies because the data may not exist that actually captures the question that you are asking, okay? You therefore could use qualitative methods that permit you to collect and analyze data about the social construction of reality, okay? But what's important is to avoid consciously the androcentric bias in research. You want to collect diverse experiences and roles and conditions facing women and men. So when you say you have a representative sample, what does it actually represent? Which part of the population does it represent? And finally, it's important to acknowledge your standpoint as a researcher. I give a couple of examples here. One is our former uh, uh, graduate PhD students at American University who wrote a chapter in her dissertation on the economics of dowry in, in India. And obviously there's no data available in terms of the patterns of exchanges, monetary as well as assets and uh, goods um, uh, uh, at the time of, as part of the dowry system. And so she did some in-depth interviews with married women to understand women's, uh, the, and to understand the power structure that underlies the dowry practice in India. So in short, gender aware methodologies and measures are quite varied, okay? But what it brings up is the following. You become more sensitive therefore to the collection method. Does it include women's responses in household? Who answers labor force survey? Is it the head of the household assuming that he knows exactly how much time and how much everyone in the household earns? Uh, is the data sex dis disaggregated? You have earnings of women and men separately. You have data on asset ownership. Are they col uh, owned collectively or separately? Okay. Collection of data on unpaid work using time serve using time use survey is now growing uh, um, and is now becoming more readily available for analysis. And finally, one other thing I want to measure is that as a result of this gender aware methodologies, new measures of well being has 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 evolved has been uh, developed, including time poverty. Okay, I will now um, pose to you a couple of questions. Feminist economics aim to promote a more inclusive economics. This includes a recognition of the crucial role of macroeconomic policies in shaping the conditions for provisioning of livelihoods and well being. That's actually towards the end of chapter two of your required reading. Now, my question to you are, my questions to you are, to what extent are conventional macroeconomic policies gender bias and therefore can yield negative impacts on women? Given the short, given the time constraint we have, this will be a second session after this lecture. I'd like you to write a short essay, your own reflection to this question and post it in Slack by 6 p.m. today. Need not be very long, a paragraph, a few hundred, um, 300 to 400 words would be fine. Second, and this is something that you can discuss with your facilitator uh, in, in, in class. What challenges do you perceive in doing research on gender aware economics, including gender aware macroeconomics. Thank you.
this session uh, will examine how to gender relations from a feminist point of view using the seminal contributions of Nancy Polbre, 1986, and Bina Arwar, 1997, as a starting point. So, as you may know, in every household, multiple decisions occur from allocation of income to different expenses to asset use. For instance, right now that we are telecommuting, for some of us, we had to get to some decisions who was going to use the office or the space office and who was going to use the living room. Also in households, some couples have to decide who can use the car in each day. But in the rural context, there's also some decisions regarding land production, stock, what stock to keep, what stock to produce, and so forth. Households members also have to make decisions about the division of paid and unpaid labor. This decision can reflect both benefits and difficulties depending on the level of conflict and or cooperation within the household. The decision may affect household members in different ways, often resulting in gender inequality against women that can persist over time. Women's participation in the labor market and their level of income can, to some extent, affect their bargaining power and even their ability to make decisions and use household economic resources. However, women abilities women's ability to actively participate in the labor market and women's bargaining power at home is also preconditioned by external factors such as community social norms. These norms, which are context and time specific, define which issues can legitimately be put up for discussion inside and outside the household. So the learning outcomes of this section are to reflect on the explanation for the gender division of labor in households and to understand what determines women's bargaining power within households. In this session, my talk will be a dialogue of different quotes from Nancy Folbre, Bina Agarwal, Amartya Sens, and others' main contributions to the understanding of gender relations in the household. I really hope that this dialogue helps you to understand this topic into some detail. So let's examine time allocation and specialization within the household. In 1986, Nancy Folbre published her seminal paper titled Hearts and Spades Paradigms of Household Economics. You will see that Folbre invites us, the reader, to start questioning the way economists investigate reality and how their views might be distorted by stereotype social perceptions regarding gender relations within household and their implications on particular patterns of division in non-wage and wage labor activities. In 1949, Brunner and Postman published a paper based on an experiment where they devised a three cards. So as you can see in this image, some of the cards presented to the subjects were normal and some were altered to see how people reacted to stimulus that did not match their expectations. They found that for as long as possible and whatever means available, a person will continue to see what they expect to see. Using this experiment as a starting point, Nancy Folbre begins her paper with a metaphor of a deck of cards. She says, household like decks of cards have suits and hierarchies. Their members are almost always differentiated by gender and age. She also emphasized that we should remember that our perceptions will be affected by the way we hope for, as well as what we expect to see. Household economics teaches us that it is too easy to confuse the hearts and spades, but it also teaches us that at least some of the cards we play with are the ones that we deal with, uh, with ourselves. In her article, Folbre challenges the notion imposed by both Marxian and neoclassical economics approaches in which the household is treated as almost a wholly cooperative altruistic unit under the billboard home sweet home. She also presents a coherent discourse as to why the feminist critique of intrafamily inequalities poses a serious challenge to conventional economic theories and ask, 
why are both neoclassical and Marxian paradigms so silent on the issue of inequality within home? Former uses lenses, feminist lenses, to understand and critically analyze how economists, mostly men, have conceptualized and created models about gender relations in the household. Curiously, Virginia Woolf, also in her essay, A Room of One's Own, in 1929, wondered, women do not write books about men, a fact that I could not help welcoming with relief. A very curious fact, it seems, and my mind wandered to picture the lives of men who spend their time in writing books about women, whether they were old or young, married or unmarried, red nose or handbag. Anyhow, it was flattering, vaguely, to feel oneself the object of such attention. In her essay, Virginia Woolf argues for a space for women, writers within a literary, lit literary tradition dominated by men. By the same token, female and feminist economists did not prevail as the author who developed theories about family economics. Margaret Gilpin Ray was one of the few who contributed to this series in 1934 in her work, Economics of Household Production. However, despite the relevant contribution that her work represented, it was originally marginalized by economists at that time, since they considered that the field of study of home economics was simple, a female distraction. In the 1970s, the development of household economics in the United States gained momentum thanks to feminist struggles, but these theories were developed by men, since men had been the main practitioners of economics up to that point. Becker's studies on the distribution of time within household were an extension of the conceptualization made by Ray. However, Becker never made mention of his intellectual debt to Ray. Also, male students have also been more likely to co-author papers or work or, on books with Becker. So like Virginia Woolf, I will ask ourselves to wonder, who was Gary Becker? What was his family like? What was his mother like? Even more, if Gary Becker had not been a man but a woman, will he come to the same theory and conclusions? Sadly, we will not be able to ask the, the last question. Gary B. Becker indeed was a man. Who was Gary Becker? I will use this document written by James J. Heckman, another Nobel Prize winner titled Private Notes on Gary Becker. So we learn a few details about Becker's life. The notes start with a quote by Friedman saying, Gary Becker is the greatest social scientist who lived and worked in the last half century. The first thing that comes to my mind, and I think it comes to your mind too, is that any female feminist economist who attempt to speak out against these theories of Gary Becker, a person who has been called the greatest social scientist of all time, not only by Ekman, but to another leading male economist has a, got a great deal of courage. So what do we know about the personal life of the greatest social scientist? Fortunately, Friedman partially ignores Stiegler who believed uh, what relevance have the details of a man's personal life to the nature of his scientific work. I am tempted to answer biography distorts rather than illuminates the understanding of scientific work. Nevertheless, Freeman gave some personal information about Becker, complemented by some photos and quotes from his sister Natalie that you can see in this slide. His sister Natalie tell me that Gary was a very athletically inclined and pursued a lot of sports, handball and stickball. His sister Natalie writes about his family influence. She, she said, we all were supposed to study hard, to focus, to plan ahead, to think independently, to not follow the crowd, to use our brain as they will say. Gary was intense about diets, about ping pong, stickball, handball, math problems, about strength, competition, not about politics, religion, art, poetry. 
So it looks like, uh, at least to me, that Gary Becker looks really like a homo economics, rational economic man with the typical characteristic of individuality, autonomy, freedom, and rationality. We could, all, we could also say that Gary Becker is the typical sports rational economic man. Then Friedman jumps in and presents an analogy with Newton, which I'm not going to discuss in today's sessions. I will leave it to you to wonder what Newton has in common with Gary Becker. And then he will continue with several quotes about Becker's work from other economists and his academic life in Chicago. In the end, I shall say, we'll find ourselves with few materials to judge Becker's family and how this could have influenced his theories. So let us take a look at a simple illustration of the neoclassical approach of comparative advantage of home production versus market production. In the next slides, I will, re I will be presenting a simple illustration of this model based on Nancy Forbes book chapter, A Theory of Misallocation of Time in 2004. The neoclassic economic view of markets as sites of free and voluntary exchange was extended to households. According to Gary Becker, women choose to specialize in non-market production within home because this represents their best option. It's like going to buy an ice cream. You choose to buy an ice cream because you want something cold. Also, women choose to specialize in non-market production because they have a comparative advantage in this work. As a result, they accumulate fewer market skills and earn lower wages. Figure 1.1 illustrates the individual decisions on the allocation of time between non-market work or domestic work in which the individual produces goods and services for her consumption and wage employment where she earns a wage. The wage is determined by the forces of supply and demand in the labor market and therefore is constant. A rational individual will allocate time to non-market work until the value of her product per hour equals the wage. At this point, she's better off reallocating his time to wage employment. Now, let's take a look to figure 1.2. That is really interesting. This figure illustrates what the model is intended to demonstrate. If men earn higher wages than women, they will allocate more time to wage employment and less to non-market work. But moreover, if male marginal product in non-market production, which is the core that you can see that is inside the women's one, if they have a lower marginal product in non-market production, then they will specialize even further into market production. However, this association can be questioned. Individual decisions may not be voluntary and may not benefit those who choose among different available alternatives. There may, there may also be discrimination in the labor market affecting women's salaries, making female wages lower and reinforcing the incentives to stay at home. Moreover, this discrimination may be stronger in male-dominated professions, creating disincentives for women to be educated in masculinized professions. The traditional division of labor itself is likely to magnify the difference in household and market skills for men and women because both skill sets increase with on-the-job experience. Therefore, and this is really important, even a small initial gender difference is likely to increase the comparative advantage considerably over time. Nancy Forbes said that whether they are efficient or first for, from a large point of view depends on the factors that are mining the shapes and the chips of all of these curves that they're looking right now. What if, for instance, men earn higher wages because of discrimination against women or are less competent, than, competent in non-market production because they are never instructed in what are considered feminine skills? Neoclassical economists not only take what people want as given, but argue that preference do not vary systematically over time or across population. It is impossible to determine to what extent women's time allocation is shaped by technology, the value of the service they provide, and to what extent it is shaped by their preferences, the direct utility they derive from the activity itself. 
And we should ask ourselves, if women were offered higher wages, would they be willing to unload some of their traditional responsibilities within the household? If it were possible for women, will they like to reorganize the family's priorities? Will they prefer to alter the division of labor to their own benefit? Besides all these questions that the model is not able to answer, we would not have any of these questions answered by the model. The comparative advantage tell us that a couple will be better off if they are together than apart. And that men tend to specialize in wage employment and women in domestic work. This is like the typical international uh, comparative advantage model in which we try to understand the division of um, domestic production between two countries. However, it does not answer the following questions. How are those earnings dividing, divided among family members? Do most of the earnings from the marriage end up in the hands of men? It is true that men succeed in pursuing or satisfying their aspiration, but women cannot. The models that incorporate bargaining power between the household members conclude that the results of these negotiations are typically efficient. However, as you may know, Pareto efficiency tells us nothing about the outcomes, how the outcomes are distributed. A Pareto efficient situation can be such that one of the members of the couple ends up with 90-90% of the benefits of the marriage and the other one with just 1%. Therefore, it is not possible to improve one individual situation without negatively affecting that of the other. So let's now take a closer look at Becker's unitary model. This model treats the household as maximizing a single utility function or household social welfare function. The neoclassical analysis of the family is based on the following underlying basic assumptions. The family is a unit whose adult members make informed and rational decisions that result in maximizing utility or well-being of the unit. The simplest model assumes that the objective of the family is to maximize its utility or satisfaction by selecting the combinations of products from which its members obtain the most significant amount of utility possible. So in this slide, you can see how the utility function looks like and all of the elements of this utility function, which I'm not going to take uh, time describing them. These kinds of economics models have also been used to explain the division of labor within the family increasing rates of participation of women in the labor force, trends in divorce rates and fertility, the increased emphasis on children uh, education, and other aspects of behavior of women and households. However, I just want you to take a closer look at the joint utility function because it poses serious problem for neoclassical theory as it requires the aggravation of individual taste and preference. However, the unitary model solves the aggregation problem by assuming that altruism prevails within the family. Also, by adding the assumption that taste and preference are exogenous, given, and random distributed. As the level of altruism is kept constant, therefore, any change in resources within the household is due to changes in prices and or income only. So the main feminist critique of the neoclassical model can be summarized as follows. First, paradoxically, the same individual who entirely, entirely selfish, selfish in the market are treated as completely selfless within the family, where they pursue the interests of the collective. It is assumed that in the home, there is a benevolent dictator, usually a man, who watches over the well-being of all members of the household. Another problem is the, related to the joint income or income pooling. This assumption tells us that the optimal consumption of goods in the household is the same. For example, there is an increase in income from the husband or the wife. Therefore, the source of income is irrelevant for this model. The only thing that matters is joint income, not individual. However, empirical evidence shows that income which enters household through different members is usually is used differently. Lundberg, Pollack, and Wales in 1996 studied a change in the United Kingdom policy. Before 1977, taxes were reduced to parents to increase spending on children. 
1979, the tax cut was eliminated and replaced with payment for mothers. They found that there was a change in spending with this policy reform. Spending on clothing for women and children and on household service increased, while spending on men's clothing and tobacco decreased. There's also a study by Audrey in 1996 for Burkina Faso found, that found that the yield of the women's crops was 30% lower than the average yield. So a misallocation of factors explains this result across plots within the family. What happened was that most of the fertilizers were used in man's plot. And as you can imagine, if the family or the household genuinely maximize the use of fertilizers, they should be better distributed, reallocated factors from plots controlled by men to plots controlled by women, given the diminishing marginal returns of fertilizers we did use. And there have been also been several other studies uh, regarding this contradiction of the income pooling assumption of the unitarity model. So this evidence of different resources allocation by household members cast considerable suspicions on the joint utility assumptions. However, neoclassical theories have reconciled these unexpected and contradictory results with the assumption that different levels of altruism may exist between men and women. Yet, why is more altruism expected from women than men? More importantly, as women begin to, begin to spend less home working within the home and more time in capitalist marketplace, will their traditional altruism persist? These are two questions raised by Nancy Paul. Therefore, it is important to ask ourselves which dynamics explain changes in preference and therefore in the relative bargaining power between generations and genders. Nancy Folbert in her paper of 1986 said, these dynamics pertain to the behavior of groups rather than individuals. They grow out of social and economic institution rather than competitive market. As a result, these dynamics are not susceptible to traditional tools of neoclassical theory. The structure of patriarchy as a system sets the stage for an analysis of bargaining power within the household. So women are wrapped or trapped in the structures of constraints. This is a term used by Nancy Fulbright in her book, Who Pays for the Kid in 1994. And these structures of constraints are built based on imposed norms and values. These systems operate through different layers, household, community, and the states. Here, I will use a metaphor of my own to understand the systems of constraints in which women are trapped and with which they must interact and bargain. We can imagine these constraints as different layers of the earth, the cross, the mantle, and the core. The household is the innermost of the three layers in which women are constrained and the epicenter where most bargaining occurs. Like in the case of air, this is, there is a great pressure on the epicenter because of all the outside layers pressing down from above. Community is the mantle, the layer below the crust, the state. The mantle is the earth's thickest layer. And like the mantle, there are typical different types of communities. And they differ based, for example, if they are located in the urban or rural areas. Urban settings might impose looser constraints on women than rural ones too. However, even within urban environments, different types of communities coexist and impose constraints on women. Urban environments can be as restricted as the rural ones. Take for instance, the case of a woman who wants to go outside during night in a urban context. These women may be face a, diff, uh, a lot of um, physical violence if she goes out of, at night in some urban context. And on, in the other case, the state is the crust, the outside layer, and the state sets the economic rules and regulations and can enforce these laws and formulate them. Later in my presentation, I will go into detail in each of these restrictions. So let's go beyond the unitary model. How easy it is to extend this model and how successful have these attempts have been? I have to say that any model that attempts to include all complex aspects of human relationships, even those limited to interactions within the household, 
must make a series of assumptions so to be a tractable model. However, these sets of assumptions can make the model more unreal. Mina Agarwal in 1997, in her seminal paper, Bargaining and Gender Relations Within and Beyond the Household, highlights the limitation even of models that go beyond the unitary one. Given that they cannot incorporate the multiple dimensions of relations within household, but more importantly, fail to take external considerations uh, like the market, the state, and the community into account. Agarwal invites us to think of analytical description as a tool to capture the complexity and historical variation of gender relations in intra and extra household dynamics. In doing so, so we should go beyond formal models, which might limit our understanding. Also, a starting point is the critique of the vision of the family as a unit where altruism prevails. Intra household interactions are characterized as containing elements of both cooperation and conflict. So we should wonder what determines when individuals cooperate and when they do not. Cooperation can be difficult to engage, as in some cases, one person gain is another person lose, even within a household. And therefore, even within households, conflict may arise. More importantly, the same person can identify with different groups their decision about whether to cooperate with some of these groups with which they identify may not be clear and might generate conflict with the party with whom she decides not to cooperate. So most of the bargaining models treat as exogenous qualitative aspects such as the role of social norms in determining bargaining power and what is contestable and what is not. Norms as objective of bargaining, how self-interest can affect the outcome of negotiations, the links between intra-household and extra-household bargaining power. According to Agarwal in 1997, within the household, the outcomes of conflict and cooperation depends on household members' relative bargaining power on the fallback position, meaning the outside option. The greater a person's ability to physically survive outside the family, the greater will be her bargaining power over subsistence within the family. However, different opportunities for different members of the household mean that to some, some have less bargaining power in, and that inequalities are generated within the household. These inequalities are mostly driven by gender. Given that women have fewer possibilities outside the home, they have a, few, a very lower fall, fallback position. So talking about the rural context in India, Agarwal says that the bargaining strength within families depends on these eight factors. Ownership of, of and control over assets, spe specifically arable land, access to employment and other income earning means, access to communal resources such as villages, common and forest, access to traditional social support systems such as patronage, kinship, caste groups, among others, support from NGOs, support from the state, social perceptions about needs, contributions, and other determinants of deservedness and social norms. She then asked if all of these factors, and we should also ask ourselves, if all of these factors carry equal weight. And this is important because more critical factors, and this will vary by context, are specifically crucial for policy. For example, Agarwal says that the effective right to land can strengthen women's fallback position in India, not only directly, but also indirectly by improving, improving return, returns from other income resources. So this is an intense temporal process in the bargaining process, as you can see. Outcomes of the bargaining at one point in time could strength or weak up person fallback positions affecting outcomes at a later point in time. Land ownership can be important for elderly women, since it is an asset that allows them to get other members of the household to commit to ensuring their well-being with expectation that those lands will be inherited by those who take good care of these women while they were alive. So what role does these social norms play here in this context. 
Social norms are the cornerstone of the bargaining process. They set the limit as to what is open to bargaining, the determine or constrain bargaining power. They affect how the process of bargaining is conducted, covertly, overly, aggressively, or quietly. They constitute a factor to bargain over. Social norms can be endogenous. They are subject to negotiation and change. For example, women's exit options in marriage depend not only on their economic prospect outside marriage, but on the social acceptability of diverse women in the society in which they live and their possibility of remarriage. So here you have a lot of women um, that you might recognize or you may not, but I will leave up to you to take your own conclusions about these images. The way social norms are defined is crucial and perceptions play a critical role in their construction. Social norms are related to customs and perceptions that get institutionalized. For instance, perceptions about needs may differ from actual needs. In many places globally, women's needs are subordinated to families' needs, while for men, the distribution between their needs and those of their family have a clear frontier. The social norm about what generates value and what does not is also affected by the perception about the jobs that are skilled or unskilled. Home-based or a wage work is often seen as less valuable than work that is remunerated. So as you take some minutes to think about these images, these images are taken from an article that states, women who decide not to be mothers have always been represented as insensitive, selfish, or villains. The article invites us to change this social norm and ask for more positive representation of inspiring women in the media. Social norms also often define how women and men must behave in different situations. Thus, they set the stage of the form that the bargaining can take place. When demands are made assertively and personality, the listening reaction differs depending on whether the person expressing the demand is a man or a woman. In the former, it's usually related to indignation or frustration, while with women, it is usually associated with hysteria. These perceptions put, put men and women in positions of advantage or disadvantage in negotiation. Remaining cool and calm in a negotiation can be more strategically advantageous than showing emotions or feelings. So let's now talk about doxa and heterodoxy. Doxa is the term used for these norms that are accepted as natural and they're evident part of the social order, not open to questions. In some contexts, for, for example, women are better at household activities than men and therefore is the, the responsibility. In bargaining models, social norms are taken as exogenous. However, they are three points of importance in relation to bargaining over social norms. The role of economic factors determine who has the power and the right to make decisions on which norms stay, but also push people to challenge norms. Economic inequality usually play a critical role in structuring power relations by giving some people greater authority over definitions and interpretations than others. The role of groups as opposed to individuals is also important. Group solidarity and collective action appear critical for contestating social norms but also group organizations empower women to confront existing sources of inequality. The role that in interactive bargaining within and outside the household plays in effectively challenge social norms is also important. However, the outcome of bargaining is defined or affected by the weight a person attaches to she or well-being relative to the well-being of others. A question that arises is what if some household members do not act in their own interest and therefore do not bargain to their best advantage? Some scholars argue that women on average are more altruistic than men because they have a less separatistic self. In this regard, Sen in 1987 said, it has often been observed that if a typical Indian rural woman were asked about her personal welfare, she will find the question unintelligible. And if she is able to reply, she may answer the question in terms of her reading of the welfare of her family. The idea of personal welfare may itself be unviable in such a context. It has been argued. 
evidence from developed and developing countries shows that women tend to spend their income, they control largely on family needs rather than on personal needs. However, with limited resources outside options, women might will well seek their maximized family welfare because it is in their long-term self-interest insofar as women are more dependent on the family for their survival than are men. Then women like men may be motivated by self-interest rather than only uh, mainly by altruism and both women and men may be concerned with individual as well as family welfare, even in different degrees. In this sense, Agarwal will conclude that we should place much less emphasis than Sen does on women's incorrect perceptions of their self-interest and much more on the external constraints that they're inter in acting overly in their self-interest. So in the five minutes that I have left, let us discuss between the household, the market, the community, and the state, the interaction, sorry, between the household, the market, the community, and the state. This diagram by Agarwal represents the interaction between the different arenas of contestation or the different unfair structures of constraints. And Nancy Forbes says, structures of constraints may be the joint outcome of efforts to solve problems of coordination and the power of distinction, social groups that force to play a disproportionate share of the cost. The efforts of previously disempowered groups to modify social inequalities are an important aspect of the evolutionary process. The interaction between these structures can reinforce each other or sometimes go in opposite directions. For example, the state may pass laws, define policies, and promote programs that favor women's bargaining power, while some communities may resist implementation of these measures. Since communities play an intermediate role between the state and individual household, these measures could have not could not have the intended benefit expected for women. It is important to understand the interrelationships between the different arenas for the bargaining pro process, as the outcomes of intra-household bargaining will be preconditioned by the outcomes of extra-household bargaining with the community and the states. So we have to understand that households operate within a large institutional setting of market, community, and state. And I will just end up with the market. One of the bargaining process that causes the most tensions for women in the market happen in the labor market with regard to job characteristics, for instance, wages, occupations, and sector segregations, positions, among others. Their bargaining power can be constrained by their skills available, information, and education. The most important constraint is determined by women's domestic responsibilities, which reduce their job options. Also, employers' assumptions regarding women's role in society limit their economic prospects. Even where women enter the, the wage labor force in large numbers, they do most of the non-market work in their house. And then we can continue and analyze the role of community and state, but I just have one minute left. So I'll just wrap up by saying that most recent studies about analysis of household dynamics emphasize that the power relations within households are unbalanced and that this relation can be problematic and complicated. Furthermore, they emphasize how gender roles and power dynamics shape household decisions and that individual household members may have different preferences that impact outcomes. More importantly, Empirical evidence of this household dynamics shows that they are context specific and based on revealing social norms. In the next section on, no, on labor markets, we will explore into more details on the interaction between these arenas or structures of constraints. Thank you. So you can look at all the reference that I used for these presentations in this uh, last slide. That I'm, that I'm showing you and that will be available to you on the web page. I will take some few minutes if you have any questions. I will have to stop sharing my screen so I can see you or I could just do this. So I don't know if someone has any question mm -hmm. or if you want to. You still do have 20 minutes left, by the way. 
Yes, but I, I need those 20 minutes for our group exercise. Oh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> so I, just let me wrap up some of the key concepts that you should have got from this session. So uh, we have learned that allocation of time between market and non-market is important and that there are relative productivities and what determines them. So for instance, these productivities can be shaped by discrimination. For instance, women could have lower wages because they are discriminated in the labor market. We have also learned about Pareto efficiency and how it doesn't help to answer questions about equity. And we have also learned some of the criticisms of the unitarity uh, labor, um, unitarity model in which there's this benevolent dictator uh, uh, that the assumption is that altruism prevails within the home while in the market we are all self-interest. That's uh, quite a puzzle, how we divided ourselves between this altruism within the home and self-interest in the market. We also have learned that there's empirical evidence that go against the assumption of labor pooling or income pooling in the, in the unitarity model. And we also have learned some of the determinants of bargaining strength or the fallback positions and how norms determine this bargaining power and what is contestable and what is not. And we have also learned uh, really quickly about the different structures of constraint that are uh, within the households, in the community and in the state. So I think it's, it's good to go to, to the group so you get to know each other more and to reflect more of this, uh, what we have learned. And what I want you to do is each group will have 10 minutes. I hope it's, it's, it's enough. And you have to select one presenter because not all of you will be able to talk. And you should prepare one slide on the following discussion uh, questions that I will show it to you in the next slide. And to prepare a present the a slide uh, so you can, when we come back, you can present it to the rest of the, the group. So I would like you to think of a situation where the women need, where a woman or, or the group or a group of women needs to bargain to improve her or their situation. And ask the following questions. What structures of constraint or external constraints, household, community, market, or state are more relevant for defining the outcome? And I want you to order them from the highest to the lower relevance. And ask yourself if the order will change depending on the context and why. And also to think of an example where the structures of constraints counteract or and another where they reinforce each other. 